I'm going to react to another clip from Jordan Peterson. Last year, I reacted to a few minutes of a college lecture that he did. This time, I'm looking at a story he tells about zebras and lions on a Canadian show. I've heard him tell other versions of this story, but it's essentially the same approach each time. And as I break this down, I'll explain how Peterson uses subtle but powerful techniques, one I'll call the magic wand, that's used by all great storytellers. The educational value of this is that we get to hear a seasoned communicator tell a story, and I'll break down some of the finer points so that we can learn how to tell stories better ourselves. If you'd like to, download the free PDF of my seven instant tips to become a more confident public speaker. I will put a link to that in the description below. The entire Peterson clip is less than three minutes, so we'll watch the whole clip together, and then I'll break it down. And at the end, you can tell me what I missed. So then I came across this story by Robert Sapolsky. I think it was Robert Sapolsky. And he was talking about zebras. And so I'll take two minutes and tell you the zebra story because if you understand this story, you understand absolutely everything about human beings. And so it's worth two minutes. So, so you know, zebras hypothetically are camouflaged, right? That's what everyone says. But come on, really? Lions are camouflaged. They're the same color as the grass. Zebras are black and white. You can see one of those things like a, a mile away. But there isn't a zebra. There's a herd of zebras. And so the zebra's actually camouflaged against the herd. Now that's something to think about. So the stripes of zebras are the zebra's jargon. That's a good way of thinking about Ooh. it. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> so anyways, so biologists go out and study zebras. And zebra biologists. And they're going to, they got to watch a zebra to figure out what it's up to. And so they watch a zebra and then they make a note and then they look up and they think, oh my god, like which collection of black and white stripes was that zebra? Because the stripes don't outline the zebra and they camouflage the zebra perfectly against the herd. So if you look away from the zebra down and back up, you don't know what you're looking at. So the biologists think, oh crap, we better, we better solve this problem. So they drive up to the herd with a jeep and a bucket of red paint and a stick with a rag on the end of it and they, they paint one of the zebra's haunches with a red spot or they clip its ear like you do with cattle. Then you can keep track of the zebra. Guess what happens to the zebra? The lions eat it. Oh. Right. Oh is right. Bloody right. Oh. Yeah. The lions cannot hunt a single zebra down unless they can identify it because they organize their hunt they have to organize their hunt around and identify. You can't hunt four zebras. You or, can only hunt right. one at you a can't, time. You can't hunt a blur of zebras. No. And so the reason they go after the little ones or the ones that limp isn't because, you know, they're part of kind nature and just culling the weak. That they like a nice, healthy, delicious, juicy zebra as much as the next person, you know. So, so but they, they have to be able to identify. So the thing is, is you make yourself colorful. You stand out. The lions will kill you. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Well, Canadians, we don't like to stand out. We like everybody to do okay. But we don't like it very much when people stand out. And so, and I mean, I'm not being entirely critical of that. I really do understand it. I really do understand it. Because there's lions out there, you guys. There are. There, that's right. There, and there, there definitely are. And if you stick your neck out, then the lions will come. Or the sword, because that's a common saying, right? Mm -hmm. The head that sticks up above the rest is the first to be cut, out, cut off by the sword. Mm -hmm. Many, many cultures have a saying like that. The poppy that grows higher right. than the rest is the, the first. The poppy syndrome. Exactly, exactly. That's a powerful story. Let's look at five reasons why his approach works so well. If he skipped any of these five elements, the story just wouldn't have the same level of impact. And then I'll talk about that big picture magic wand he uses to make the story extra special. So be sure to stick around to the end for that. First, I love the way he starts. It's a story within his own story. He explains learning about this research as an experience that he had. I came across this story by Robert Sapolsky. I think it was Robert Sapolsky. And he was talking about zebras. He doesn't just cite some research about zebras. He tells us about his own educational journey through it, and he brings us along with him. That helps us as listeners get into story mode much more quickly. Second, he signals up front that the zebra story is really a way to understand people. A good communicator tells stories to help make their point. He's not simply trying to entertain listeners. He wants to inform us. He even turns and faces his listeners and says his point directly. If you understand this story, you understand absolutely everything about human beings. He doesn't give away yet exactly how zebras and people are alike at the beginning, but he's giving us a heads up about what to pay attention to. Third, he brings the story to life by telling it from the researcher's point of view. 
He knows his story is more likely to have an impact if he says it in a colorful way. So he does a bit of acting. He pretends he's a zebra researcher who just lost track. They watch the zebra and then they make a note and then they look up and they think, oh my God, like which collection of black and white stripes was that zebra? He pretends to visually take notes and paint the zebra's backside and tag its ear. He is telling the story almost as if he's on the inside of it, like he's one of the researchers. And that brings us as listeners inside of it with him. That's much more engaging than talking about the same research as if he were an outside observer. That would have kept us as listeners on the outside as well. Fourth, he shares the key conclusion of the study. Lions don't select a specific zebra to hunt because it's injured or the youngest. Lions select a zebra because it stands out the most. He lets that sink in for a moment. He then brings the analogy full circle. Great storytellers land on what we call the moral to the story, the bigger lesson learned. Most inexperienced storytellers don't do this very well, but he does. He says, well, Canadians, we don't like to stand out. We like everybody to do okay. But we don't like it very much when people stand out. The moral to the story is that if you stand out, society will come after you. He reinforces the point by mentioning other Similar sayings like the head that sticks up above the rest is the first to be cut off by the sword. That builds a package for the story. It's like a sandwich. Almost all great storytellers do this. They design their stories this way. He signals up front that this story will compare zebras and lions with people. And he tells the story. And then at the end, he explains the connection between zebras and lions and people in more detail. So we as his listeners don't miss the point. All five of those elements accumulate to make this a powerful story. If you had missed any of those five, this moment would have been good, but not necessarily great. But big picture, here is why I think this story is not just an A, but an A+. He's not just combining a story and an analogy. He's using what I call a little magic wand. He's enlisting fairly exotic animals in his story. So how does this function as a magic wand? When a magician says some magic words, snaps his fingers, or waves an actual wand, it's a mechanism that allows the audience to suspend our disbelief. It engages our imagination, and it helps us go along with it. In a story, the source of magic can be anything. The power can come from infinity stones, or a magic ring, or a special time-traveling phone booth. Or in this case, Peterson's magic wand is zebras and lions. In stories, we often associate exotic animals with something mysterious or magical. Animals engage our imagination and emotions in ways that stories about regular people do not. Animals transport us more easily into the story. So as soon as Peterson says, I came across a story about zebras, as listeners, we can feel the magic wand working on us. We are already leaning forward and saying to ourselves, zebras, I want to hear all about this. We suspend our disbelief, we lower our defenses, and it makes us curious, softens us up, and allows us to listen without feeling attacked. It takes then almost no extra effort at the end to get us to accept that zebra and lion behavior are also true perhaps for human behavior. Now don't forget, he's talking about us, or at least Canadians who are in the audience. He's saying that we don't like it when people rise up too high. We like to take them out. And we shouldn't be that way. So it could feel bad to hear it come straight at us like this. I don't know about you, but I didn't feel defensive at all because he was talking mostly about zebras. So we hang in there and at the end, maybe even chuckle at ourselves a little bit. Stories and analogies are powerful in their own right, but including exotic animals really opens us up almost magically to listen and accept his point. And by the way, for fans of Peterson, you'll notice a couple of other items. One is that even though this clip is several years old, this is really what happened to him. He did this interview before he got really popular. So he stood up then a little too high and distinguished himself. And as a result, society has attempted to take him out. Another thing you'll notice is that he uses animals in other stories. Most famously, his analogy comparing lobsters to people in his book. It's also important to know that Peterson uses lots of different communication strategies. He cites research and historical information when he's giving presentations and in his books. He gives personal examples, stories, and analogies like this one. We're just looking at one specific instance here, but he's a very well-rounded communicator and we can learn a lot from him. Be sure to download that free PDF I mentioned with the seven instant tips to become a more confident public speaker. I'll put links to that in the description below.
Question for you, what did I miss? And what are your thoughts about this story, analogies, and that concept of the magic wand of storytelling? And who else should I react to? I look forward to reading your comments in that section below.